Murder and manslaughter, the most serious crimes people can commit. Police departments around the world are working on solving as many of these crimes as possible, but there are many unreported cases that go undetected. The change that scientists and police investigators are perfecting a new range of astonishing methods because these crime fighters have one thing in common. Their work starts when someone else's life ends. A mother and her two children are found in their apartment in Neuss, Germany, shot dead. What exactly happened here? In Nancy, France, a hospital nurse goes missing. Later, her body is found. What can traces of blood in the apartment of the nurse and her live-in boyfriend tell us about her death? Philip Esperanza is an expert in the field of blood stain analysis. If we are successful in correctly interpreting bloodstain patterns, we can figure out the events that created them. A difficult discipline. The patterns are very complex. It requires good training and a lot of experience to decode them correctly. Forensics expert Robin Cotton from Boston University is familiar with the problems with poorly trained so-called experts in the field. There's a risk that they may speak beyond their real area of expertise. Um, we've certainly had our share of scandals in the U.S. Molecular biologist Cornelius Kortz can make firearms talk. It's important that we don't keep this to ourselves. This is a technology all criminal investigations should profit from. The scientist is especially interested in the inside of firearms. In the evening of August 20th, 2012, the doorbell of an apartment in Neuss, Germany is ringing. Relatives are here to pick up the 26-year-old Zaskia and her two children to go out to dinner. But nobody answers the door. They can hear music coming from the apartment. The relatives are worried. They call the police. At about 6.30 p.m., police officers enter the apartment. As soon as they open the door, they are faced with a horrible scene. The young mother and her two children are sprawled on the floor, shot to death. They collect possible trace evidence for later analysis at the crime lab. The homicide department in Dusseldorf is leading the investigation. Chief Detective Guido Adler recalls the slaying of this family. The homicide department had been alerted. And as chief, I was leading the investigation in this case. I always visit the crime scene myself in such cases and have a look at the situation there to be better prepared for possible questions later on. But even at first glance, it became obvious that all three victims had been shot to death. That was beyond any reasonable doubt. However, it still could have been the case that since the perpetrator showed a lot of criminal energy, that he had a second murder weapon or another weapon that might have been used in this crime. Oder zusätzlich ausgeübt haben könnte. A weapon is found at the crime scene with Fala O's fingerprints on it. The officers suspect that he used it to kill his own family. In order to convict Fala O of killing his wife Zaska and her two children, the investigators have to find their traces on the weapon too. The officers have high hopes for a new investigatory method, molecular ballistics. They reach out to Cornelius Kortz. The founder of this method was then working at the Institute for Forensic Medicine in Bonn. His research is focused on molecular analysis of backspatter traces in firearms.
Molecular ballistics is a term we coined to describe this research field. It is basically a molecular biological analysis of traces that occur when firing a shot at a biological target, where you face a complex trace evidence situation and where you want to reconstruct firearm crimes using the components of trace evidence. Some components, like backspatter in the firearm, can be analyzed from a molecular biological angle. That's what we call molecular ballistics. In the so-called backspatter effect, traces are expelled from the victim's gunshot entry wound. Quartz is now head of the Department for Forensic Genetics at the Institute for Forensic Medicine at Keele University. His molecular ballistics research project is the only one of its kind in the world. Boston, Massachusetts, one of the oldest cities in the USA, once known for its infamous mobsters and murderers, today the city is considered to be one of the safest in the United States. Boston University is one of the first universities that offers a graduate program for a degree in forensic science, which can be used in the fight against crime. Today, this subject is taught at several colleges in the United States. The distinctive thing about the program in Boston is the focus on forensic medicine. Robin Cotton is director of the program. Her expertise has already been requested in more than 200 court trials in the United States. The most prominent, the O.J. Simpson case. The forensics expert falls back on one basic rule, as all her colleagues do as well. I think basically the rule is saying if a person is involved and there's an event, you're likely to leave some trace of yourself at that event, whether it's a fiber from your scarf or some saliva from your mouth or some blood because you've been cut, those things happen. Uh, what we need to remember is can we understand the context of those trace transfers in relationship to a case? In 1910, the Frenchman Edmond Lacard, co-founder of modern forensics, postulates a groundbreaking rule by stating, no contact between two objects is possible without leaving some traces on each other. This Locard rule, this principle of reciprocity, I paraphrase it by saying objects leave traces on each other upon contact. But that's a bit difficult here, that since with backspatter there's no contact. It means it is not necessary for the firearm to touch its target. But, as a matter of fact, through the impact of the projectile on the target, there's a hole, and the target expels material back towards the firearm, and that means that contact is mediated through the projectile, and so you could say that this process leaves traces on both, back spatter on and in the firearm, and a hole and gunshot wound in the target. Molecular ballistics is, like gunshot wound ballistics, a specialty of forensic ballistics. The London police officer, Henry Goddard, is considered the founder of this discipline. In 1835, he convicts a criminal on the basis of a raised bump on the fatal lead bullet. In the suspect's department, Goddard discovers a mold from the bullets. There's one indention that matches exactly the bump in the bullet found in the victim. The suspect confronted with this confesses to the crime. He shot his boss and staged a burglary to cover the tracks of his crime. In the case of the brutal slaying of the children and their mother in Neuss, Germany, Kurtz and his colleagues try to recover as much trace evidence from within the firearm as possible. 
A firearm has many interior surfaces. A pistol is very complex mechanically. The barrel of a pistol, for example, is not exposed. Its inside surface is hidden under the slide. And when you pull back the slide, it exposes the barrel. You could take off the slide and also remove the barrel. You could swab the inside of the barrel, the barrel's surface inside the slide, in the front, in the back, at the muzzle. These are all surfaces, interior surfaces, that are not in direct contact with the outside world, where you can find backspatter, where you can recover backspatter. Most people are shot at close range, but even when the shot comes from a distance of several meters away, backspatter can reach the firearm. Which surfaces in the firearm become important in this analysis? This is the slide, and this interior area of the pistol is not accessible from the outside, and that means spatter could end up in here and on these inside surfaces of the slide. Here, samples were taken that helped to identify all three victims. Not only here, but that was one of the parts. For example, here, behind the muzzle, that is also on the inside. Here, too, we found traces that showed these unique characteristics. Bloodstain pattern analysis is inseparably linked with ballistics. Europe's expert in this field lives close to the Mediterranean Sea in the south of France, Marseille. The oldest city in France was founded in 600 BC. Legend says it happened because of a love story. Today, the second biggest city in France is also known to be the most dangerous in the country. Violent crimes, robberies, and drug trafficking are just a part of daily life. This is where you find the headquarters of Philip Esperanza, expert for bloodstain pattern analysis. Esperanza's calling is the reading and decoding of complex traces of blood at crime scenes. He is consulted in numerous court trials and investigations in France. Today, the expertise of the biologist and mathematician is sought after in the entire world. This discipline was rather ignored for a long time. Shortly before World War II, it saw its first boost. Then, in the 70s, it started making a name for itself. But it was always based on the interpretation of cases. For a long time, there was no scientific background. It was pure observation, so the approach was rather empirical. In recent years, the field of bloodstain pattern analysis has made fast headway. Esperanza has a lot to do with that success. He is continuously working on improving his field. The expert is consulted in cases where the trace evidence is inconclusive, as it is in a case in Nancy, eastern France. In the night of June 28th to 29th, 2014, the 34-year-old hospital nurse, Julie M., disappears without a trace. The police called to the scene contact the forensic team. The apartment of the young woman and her live-in boyfriend is searched. The forensic technicians find traces of blood, in particular in the bedroom and bathroom of the couple. They also go over the boyfriend's car with a fine-toothed comb, inch by inch. The blue light of the chemi-luminescent flashlight amplifies contrast and makes blood come out dark. And indeed, the technicians find traces of blood in the man's car. The results from all the collected evidence points towards the boyfriend being involved in Julie's disappearance. Philip Esperanza will play an important role in solving this case. Back to Düsseldorf in Germany, the deadly crime in the Neuss neighborhood is all over the news. A father shoots and kills his own children and their mother? Unfathomable. The investigators are under immense pressure. At the same time, Kurtz and his colleagues are examining the possible murder weapon. 
They analyze the samples they have drawn using the so-called STR method. This allows them to identify different DNA patterns. These so-called STR systems, which stands for short, tandem, repeat, these are stretches on the DNA that are distinctive for every human. We always examine a lot of these stretches, sometimes 17 or more, to find a unique makeup in their combination that is unique in people. And each of these systems is represented here by such a stretch of DNA. So. It is only a section from a DNA profile that, as we said, consists of 17 systems. And it is this combination of characteristics that every person has in the system, which are unique for one person. The profiles the scientists obtained exceed their expectations. In six of eight samples, they find sufficient analyzable mixed DNA profiles, the indicator that the DNA traces come from several victims. This is the first use of molecular ballistics in a homicide case anywhere in the world. The method is able to prove a connection between the murder weapon and the victim. How did this research project come about? It was a collaboration in 2010 with my then colleague, who now works in Bern. His research focus is in the field of gunshot wound ballistics. I am a forensic molecular biologist. We, and, and that's quite normal in research, we're just sitting together, putting on our thinking caps, floating some ideas, when he introduced the backspatter system to me. I hadn't heard about it before, and I said, well, why can't we investigate that? And he said, it has never worked. No one ever did that. And I said, let's give it a try. And then we thought, let's shoot at dummies, and that worked really well. That encouraged us to combine it with DNA, but also with RNA, with micro-RNA, and on the surface of firearms. And that is how this developed into a wonderful research topic. Now, back to the case of the missing nurse in Nancy, France. The young woman's boyfriend is the main suspect. He insists that Julie cut herself that evening, and that's how her blood got spilt in the apartment. In the night of her disappearance, he slept on the couch. When he woke up the next morning, she had already gone. The story leaves the investigators unconvinced. On July 2nd, 2014, he is indicted. But they still don't have any hard evidence and no sign of the young woman's body. It's the results they receive from the bloodstain pattern expert, Philip Esperanza, that points the investigators into the right direction. The beginnings of modern bloodstain analysis can be traced back to the late 19th century. They are associated with some rather gory and gruesome experiments. At the Institute for Forensic Medicine of the University of Krakow, the researcher Edward Piotrowski works with rabbits. He bludgeons them to death with a hammer. Then he examines the distribution of the spattered blood. In 1895, he publishes his treatise, Origin, Shape, Direction, and Distribution of Bloodstains, Following Head Wounds Caused by Blows. Piotrowski's method was extremely brutal, but he realized something. Interpretation of bloodstain patterns can help solve homicides. It offered completely new possibilities in the area of crime reconstruction. Five to six liters of blood circulate in the human body. The bodily fluid consists of cellular particles and plasma that is liquid. This gives blood its characteristic flow properties and higher viscosity. Flow behavior plays an important role in the creation and distribution of blood stains. Experience in various scientific disciplines like physics and mathematics are an important prerequisite to professionally assess the biophysical characteristics of blood and its complex trace patterns. The field of research is developing even as we speak. Esperanza and some of his most renowned colleagues are members of the IABPA, the International Association of Blood Pattern Analysts. 
The organization was established in 1983. Its mission, the research, dissemination, and promotion of bloodstain pattern analysis. The International Consortium of Experts founded the organization for a reason. Reading bloodstains correctly is complex. However, in the past, some of the results from self-proclaimed experts in this field proved to be wrong. In some of the worst cases, they even led to wrongful convictions. In particular, in the USA, a number of cases have been reopened in the last few years. Reconstructing the trajectories of droplets of blood is complicated. One has to consider a variety of mechanical and physical conditions. Poorly trained bloodstain pattern analysts have drawn the wrong conclusions from crime scene bloodstain patterns. This is a very serious issue. Their conclusions can put innocent people behind bars. Expert Robin Cotton knows how important solid scientific training is. That is, sometimes the courts uh, aren't looking sufficiently closely at what makes an expert an expert. And it is true in the U.S. that um, you have experts in, in all areas, not DNA included, where the expert in front of the court has a Bachelor of Science degree, uh, some cases a master's degree, and in some cases a PhD. So the scientific background of somebody with a Bachelor of Science degree is really different than somebody with a PhD. So it doesn't mean they haven't done a good job doing the analysis that they did, but it does sometimes mean that they, there's a risk that they may speak beyond their real area of expertise. Um, we've certainly had our share of scandals in the US. And in addition, the methodology experts apply to arrive at their findings are often not questioned enough. The reason for that might be rooted in the different legal systems in the USA and Europe. In Europe, in France, and in other countries, the approach to finding the truth is to find the truth on behalf of the court. The judge does not ask us to accuse or exonerate the suspect. A just judge says, give me the facts. This forces us to do our investigation on a truly scientific basis and then present the findings to the court. Because in the trial, we will be asked, this is your conclusion? How did you arrive at this conclusion? And so we have to explain our analysis method in detail. The problem is, in America, this is not the case. For Esperanza, this is due to the different legal systems. While in the USA, you employ emotions to convince a jury of a defendant's innocence or guilt, in most European countries, you have to submit your results in a more sober manner. The problem with the United States is that experts go far beyond purely scientific results. Cases like Staircase are those where expert witnesses testify exactly what is expected of them. It's more about pleasing those who pay you than telling the truth. That, unfortunately, is a typically American method. Durham, North Carolina. Here, the famous writer Michael Peterson lives with his wife Kathleen, a successful entrepreneur. It is December 9th, 2001. Late in the evening, a call is made from the Petersons' home to the local emergency line. On the phone, you hear a rattled Michael Peterson. He says his wife has fallen down the stairs and is severely injured. The paramedics arriving at the scene can only pronounce Kathleen Peterson dead. An accident, says the husband, but the police don't believe him. They open an investigation with him as a suspect, and eventually Michael Peterson is charged with the murder of his wife. The DA's office calls the bloodstain pattern expert Duane Deaver as their expert witness. Deaver testifies that the reconstruction of the event clearly indicates that Kathleen Peterson did not fall but was beaten to death. This is the only way to explain the bloodstain pattern, says Deaver. In particular, the bloodstain on the inside of Michael Peterson's shorts can only be explained through blood 
that splashed from a blow to Kathleen Peterson's head. Deaver convinces the jury. At the beginning, the jury was undecided on the question of Peterson's guilt or innocence. It was the results that Deaver testified to which led to the unanimous verdict by the jury. Peterson is guilty. The judge follows the jury's verdict. On October 1st, 2003, Michael Peterson is sentenced to life in prison without possibility of parole. Then in 2011, the scandal. Joanne Deaver had manipulated bloodstain pattern procedures, analyses, and results of numerous court trials in favor of the prosecution. At a hearing in December 2011, the mistakes in Deaver's experiments are revealed by an expert in bloodstain patterns. In particular, the experiment that Deaver ran on the bloodstain on Peterson's shorts was not objective and clearly leaned towards the prosecution's side, says the expert. Furthermore, the defense team can prove Deaver's lack of experience and poor training. The judge rules in favor of reopening the case. The case dominates the headlines. On account of Deaver's vague statements, on his experiments, his training and experience, the forensic science of bloodstain pattern analysis as a whole is called into question. The so-called staircase scandal also shows how great the responsibility is for forensic experts. There haven't been enough control checks for too long, and so some bloodstain pattern analysts claim to be experts without having had proper training. The repercussions of these mistakes are very grave, since this is about people's lives. We mustn't forget that. This responsibility, even if it is on us in only a small measure, forces us to be very accurate in our work and to meet scientific standards. I've been fighting for 20 years to disclose and document exactly how one works. IABPA's and Philip Esperanza's work is making an impact. In the USA, the methodical application of bloodstain pattern analysis is also improving. For Red Hay, a large forest at the outskirts of Nancy, France, is a very popular local area for recreation. On July 14, 2014, a hiker makes a horrible discovery here. Off the beaten path in the woods, he finds a fire pit with human bones in the cold ashes. Among them, a charred human skull. He calls the police. The forensics team arrives. They search the crime scene inch by inch where the body was found. All traces are bagged, marked, and put into evidence. DNA testing of the bones confirm these are the remains of the missing nurse, Julie M. But this is not yet the final proof of the suspect's guilt. Without any doubt, a bloodstain found in the trunk of his car came from the dead body, a fact for which the suspect has no plausible explanation. He insists on his innocence. His attorneys cast doubt on the reliability of bloodstain analysis. The analysis of bloodstains has a long history. There has often been only a thin line between successful trials and unfortunate errors. The foundation for classifying bloodstains was laid by a professor for forensics. Victor Balthazard works at the Sorbonne University in Paris. In 1939, a conference for forensic medicine is held here. Balthazard, together with his colleagues, introduces his publication, Research on Bloodstains. It is not only the overall result which is important to the authors, the analysis of bloodstain patterns, but also the event that created each individual partial bloodstain and the bloodstain pattern as a whole. How did the blood expel from the wound? How and following which path did it transform into the bloodstain that is eventually available and then analyzed? 
The analysis of a blood stain is based on several stages. The first step is finding the blood stain. It is about examining the morphology of the blood stain. Two criteria are used here. First, we examine the shape of the blood stain. Mainly, is it circular or oval? There are other shapes possible, but those two are the most common to occur. Then size. Are the blood droplets a millimeter in size or more in the magnitude of centimeters? Then distribution. Is it a distribution that is convergent? Do all blood stains converge on the same point? Or is it a distribution pattern where all blood stains come one after the other, what is called linear? The last element to consider then is the scattering. Where are all these points? With the examination of all these elements, we are in a position to interpret the pattern of the blood stains. When we are done with that, we move to the sequence of events that created this specific pattern in that place. Different blood stain patterns don't always lead to clear and conclusive explanations. Still, they are an important element of crime reconstruction. They allow to assess the scene, type, and intensity of the violent impact. Questions on details are answered during a crime reconstruction. In individual cases, these examinations help to distinguish between a homicide, a suicide, or the attempt to fake a crime. All these details have to be checked out in order to solve the violent death of nurse Julie M. But there is still no evidence that would stand up in court. Later, the decisive piece of information which leads to the conviction of the murderer will come from Esperanza. Back at the Kiel Fjord, Cornelius Kortz is preparing an experiment. In his research, he also wants to examine the RNA inside the firearm. There is a great variety of different RNA variants and RNA functions in general. The task of RNA is to transport information contained in the DNA and transcribe it. And RNA also influences gene activity, how a genotype is expressed in an organism. The difference between DNA and RNA, both are nucleic acids, is that DNA is identical in every body cell and tissue, meaning DNA does not tell you what kind of body tissue, which organ you are dealing with. RNA is different in its composition for every body tissue and body cell types, so that when analyzing RNA, you can conclude what type of organ or body tissue it came from. This insight can be of crucial importance for the reconstruction of a crime, and that's why analyzing RNA makes sense and is necessary. In order to tell the difference between a headshot and a shot to other body parts, Quartz forms the following hypothesis. In a headshot, blood and brain matter are expelled as backspatter due to the impact of the gunshot entry. To test his hypothesis, he has to be able to distinguish between pure blood and a mix of blood and brain matter. Setting up shooting experiments is everyday business for the experts, even if it takes some time-consuming prep work. Also these ballistic all the ballistic and experimental shots are time-consuming in terms of logistics. You need a shooting range where it is legal to discharge a firearm, where safety regulations are met. You need someone with a gun permit who can carry and fire a gun. We have a weapons expert in our team. You need the firearm itself, the ammunition, an enormous amount of material. You have to cover a room to prevent splashes, and you need this mobile lab. In the first use of ballistics in a court case, shooting tests played a part in solving a crime. The trial took place in the USA in 1902. An expert has a shot fired from the alleged crime weapon at a big cotton ball. The retrieved bullet is a match with the bullet found in the murdered victim, and this is how they found their murder weapon. The suspect is convicted. 
Since then, ballistics have improved tremendously and has grown much closer with other forensic disciplines. Court's goal, he wants to combine findings from gunshot entry traces and bloodstain pattern analysis with backspatter traces in firearms. This would allow a detailed reconstruction of the exact sequence of events of a firearm crime. We took shots at ballistic bottles we had filled with a mix of blood and various tissues in order to prove if the method for detecting different organ tissues we had developed at the lab can be applied to real forensic samples the way they are created in such a shooting experiment. The most important traces scientists examine in the case of a crime are the so-called Big Five. To be able to distinguish between them, Quartz puts different mixes of blood, tissue, and other liquid in the shooting bottles. Yes, Big Five is an informal term people in the world of forensics use. It designates the five major bodily fluids we routinely have to examine in criminal cases. Saliva, semen, blood, vaginal secretion, and menstrual blood. In particular, semen, vaginal secretions, and menstrual blood are fluids that often play a role in sex crimes. It is important that we can identify these fluids. And one of my projects works in identifying these fluids, either as an individual fluid or in a mix. How does this work exactly? We do that by analyzing the RNA, in this case even microRNA, the distribution of which is specific for this bodily fluid. And that means the distribution of microRNA in saliva is different from blood. And if I can determine a blood-specific distribution, I can conclude that this mix contains blood or saliva or semen or blood and saliva. RNA yields more detailed information than DNA. What makes RNA special is that it is different in various cell types. This different RNA is created from the same DNA. Robin Cotton explains. The DNA that creates that, from which that RNA is created, is the same. So if I need to tell uh, whether something's saliva, Let's say I have a, a stain and I and I it's very dilute perhaps. So I can't really see the redness from the blood. I just know I have a stain. I can look at the RNA from that stain to help me to know whether it's from saliva or blood or semen or vaginal fluid because the RNA is different in those different cell types. So RNA can be very useful. The investigations into the slaying of the family in Neuss are ongoing. Fala O oh flew to Turkey only a few hours after his family members were shot to death. From there, he presumably went off the grid in his hometown in Iraq. He is a major suspect. Even if the chances of catching him are slim, the investigators want to carry on with the case, just to be prepared for a possible court trial. Yes, scientific matters have begun to play an increasingly larger part in police work. The saying used to be, the confession is the crowning achievement of evidence. That may still be true, but I believe that every judge likes to have scientific proof of a crime, and here it was only about reconstructing the crime more closely. We were able to secure the murder weapon, and it was all about determining the shooting distance and being certain that the weapon we found was the actual murder weapon. And so the investigators seek assistance from science. To charge a suspect with multiple murders, you have to be able to prove it. Cornelius Quartz detects DNA material from all three victims on the slide and behind the muzzle of the firearm. The largest piece of analyzed tissue is the size of only half a millimeter. 
Court's analysis tells us that the weapon found at the crime scene is the murder weapon. An arrest warrant is issued for Fala O, oh, whose fingerprints were found on this weapon. He is being charged with three counts of manslaughter. Fala O oh allegedly killed his two children and their mother. Until this day, he is a fugitive with an international warrant for his arrest issued. Guido Otler will never forget this case, and he has not given up hope to one day apprehend the alleged killer. With all the tragedy associated with this case, and we are all aware of that, me personally as well, and I believe I've never had a case quite so brutal. But in the end, our goal can only always be to prove someone has committed a crime, so that if this person is on trial for this crime, that he or she is found guilty and the verdict carries the adequate sentence. For courts, however, this case was a breakthrough. Molecular ballistics had been used in a possible murder case for the first time. The media is starting to take notice of this new research field, an important step ahead for the new forensic discipline. The fact is, we really learned something for our practical applications. Of course, we tried that out before on firearms we shot at shooting bottles or firearms used in suicides and learned that other interior surfaces also play a role and kept on developing this method. We don't want to keep this to ourselves. We publish it. We want to get it out there because we want it to be used and not pretend we are the only ones able to swab a firearm. It's about this becoming a standard, that every time a firearm is used in a homicide, that the interior of the firearm is considered as a carrier of traces, and that firearms are swabbed as a matter of routine. That is our goal. And everybody can do this. After doing it a couple of times, every lab knows how this works. We demonstrate it to everybody who cares to know, but it is important that we don't keep this to ourselves, but that this is a method criminal investigation can profit from. Cornelius Quartz is a pioneer. He is the first to help solve a murder case with the molecular ballistic analysis of traces in a firearm. And the molecular biologist continues working to develop his research field. Back to France. In the case of the murdered Julie M. from Nancy, there still is no solid evidence to prove the suspect's guilt in the winter of 2015. Philip Esperanza is asked for his expertise. He travels to Nancy and has a closer look at the apartment of the dead woman and also at the suspect, her boyfriend. Are there still invisible traces of evidence waiting to be discovered? He also wants to review some of the statements from her boyfriend. After the investigators were able to connect the DNA found in the traces of blood in the apartment to his girlfriend, her boyfriend said she had hurt herself inadvertently and he himself had wondered about the amount of blood she had lost. But his explanations did not convince the investigators, and they had doubts about the situation of the trace evidence. So the judge asked me almost a year later to go to the victim's apartment to run some examinations. The court commissioned Esperanza to re-examine the bloodstains in the apartment thoroughly. He was asked to find out if the distribution pattern of the blood is consistent with the suspect's statement. When we arrived at the crime scene, we had to face the question of which substance we should use to identify the surfaces to be examined. There were only the aluminol-based products that reacted with all the surfaces but can also destroy DNA. And then I had the idea to develop a new luminol-based solution that made bloodstains visible without destroying any DNA. So I developed Blue Star. This substance even makes bloodstains visible that are washed out, wiped off, or invisible to the naked eye. And the special feature is that the blood's DNA stays intact. Since the traces have to be photographed in absolute darkness, 
it requires good camera equipment and a tripod. And, as with all crime scenes, you have to do a centimeter test and you need some reference scale. All traces are given a number to correctly identify them later. Here, for example, trace evidence number one. When we are done with that, we can start with our investigations. Esperanza's invention has a unique property. The chemi-illuminescent effect lingers on for a long time. That makes it easier to take pictures of the bloodstain pattern later. And indeed, utilizing Blue Star, Esperanza is able to find clear evidence in the victim's house. And so I could extend my investigations in the apartment and re-examine it for other traces. I discovered many bloodstains that nobody else had found before. And these traces led me to believe that there must have been a heavy blow that was focused on a person who was in a rather weak position. In the crime scene photos, there was a mattress lying on the floor. The bloodstain patterns suggested that a person lying on that mattress had been beaten. The distribution of the bloodstains led me to the conclusion that the person who carried out the blows must have hovered above the victim between the bed and the front door of the apartment. Esperanza's bloodstain pattern analysis proved the following scenario. The perpetrator was standing next to the victim that was lying on the bed. From this position, he had beaten down on her. That is the final proof. Hafid M. was convicted in February 2018. Many months of investigations and expert opinions from various fields have led to this point. Communication is the alpha and the omega here. So it's really a communication problem, right? It's a communication problem of having the police talk to the scientists so that we understand their needs and then go in the reverse, talk to the, the scientists, also give information to the police to help them understand why something like changing gloves would make a difference. So there, there's that rub, that's one. And the other is that in some instances, the case analysis may be better served if there isn't more information than necessary given about the case to the person that's working the evidence. The goal, no undue influence of scientists, no contamination of evidence. The smudging of traces is only rarely a problem for Cornelius Quartz in his field of molecular ballistics. The interior of a firearm is seldom touched in any crime scene walkthroughs, and still, even here, the smallest traces can contaminate the results the more reason to keep on developing these tests. Yes, one goal of our research is, of course, to restage this shooting more and more realistically. And since homicides often involve shots to the head, we want to develop an improved head dummy to better show the impact of the shot to the head. And that's why we have ordered this anatomically accurate head dummy and use it as the basis for building our experimental ballistic head dummies to better replicate a frontal shot or a shot to the temple or an execution-style shot to the back of the head. Court's research field of molecular ballistics is still at the beginning. He is working on development of new methods and wants to raise awareness of them. High-speed photography of the head dummy helps to visualize the back spatter. It's like a fountain coming out, and it clearly shows that this phenomenon from the dummy experiments occurs in real life, and also explains that 
back spatter reaches farther than was believed before, not only in the firearm that has direct contact here, but can also be found if the firearm is here. You can see the individual droplets fly. The back spatter can reach all the way here. It is slowly lowering back into the trajectory of the individual back spatter droplets again, and this is how they can end up in the interior of the firearm. The scientific methods are becoming increasingly accurate. Philip Esperanza in Marseille knows this too. He feels his field is developing well. The scandals around bloodstain pattern analysis and criticism that comes up again and again has also helped to continuously improve the methodology. I'm already very confident about the future. I can also see that my American colleagues want to establish more scientific methodology in their work. That is a good thing at least. Slowly, the scientific approach is arriving in our field, and that has been growing for about 20 years. And even the global enthusiasm for true crime formats, as reflected in the many TV shows on the subject, have a positive side. We call it the CSI effect. All these TV shows might have their downside, but they also have an upside. They get students interested in forensic disciplines, and suddenly the university world is opening up. In our disciplines, the number of scientists who want to develop the scientific foundation of the field is on the rise. The Kiel University also wants to spark enthusiasm for this research in young talents. Cornelius Kortz trains his PhD candidates in the field of molecular ballistics. Together, they work on honing their investigation skills. The bloodstain pattern analyst Philip Esperanza works out of Marseille with colleagues from all over the world to get closer to the truth with the help of science. These experts from various fields of forensics all have one thing in common. Their goal, to make the perfect murder impossible. <laughs>